Sibling dynamics take center stage as Ashley confronts brother Seth, sparking a family feud over art preferences. Watch Les the Pawn Shop Detective figure out a mystery with messy DJs and laptops held captive. See the suspenseful investigation unfold right here. Laugh and cringe as a shouting woman causes trouble in the pawn shop, making Seth and Les really mad. Then a guard shows up and there's a surprising twist outside. Okay, I went to get my purse back to make my payment. She's telling me this is expired. That's my purse right there. That one right there is black one. The meticulous lady strides in armed with confidence in a fake receipt, proclaiming ownership of a purse. Little does she know that Ashley is the store's memory bank, fully aware of every item in its rightful place. The girl in her eagerness attempts to vault over the counter, unaware that Ashley, the guardian of scams, is on duty. My purse right there. How do you know that's your purse? Because I know my purse. Here's the money. I want the purse. That bag would never impose. If you want to buy it, I just want to look at it and make sure it's not mine. Undeterred by gravity and common sense, the girl persists in her charade. However, Ashley stands firm, recognizing the futility of the scam and the level of wrongness involved. It's like trying to sneak a peek at the answer key when the teacher is watching. Yeah, that's not happening. I got it. First of all, I told you like I'm an idiot. You. Give me my purse or I'm going to come over that counter and get it myself. With a swift resolution to this failed escapade, the girl finds herself unceremoniously escorted out of the store. Lesson learned, Ashley's scam radar is always on and jumping over counters won't get you far in this pawn-filled drama. Alright, deal. I think I got a good deal and I know I'm going to be able to make some money on it. I can't believe you spent that much. Whatever, Ash. I am fuming. My brother just spent $800. Enter the family feud. Ashley drops the bomb on her brother Seth, calling him a hypocrite. But why? Well, he casually throws around $880 for a painting while Ashley, according to her, can't even snag a deal for 30 bucks. Sibling dynamics at their finest. But he'll yell at me over a $30 buy. Excuse me, Seth. What, Ash? Um, I was just out there watching you do a buy for $880. So instead of working and watching me. I was out there, mm -hmm. and you bought something for $880 when you gave me such crap about that $30 roulette table. Okay. I'm not buying plastic. I'm buying stuff that we can actually resell without a problem. We will never resell that. They will sit in the back and rot. Are you kidding? We'll put it around the not floor. We're going to make $1,000 plus really? on the deal. Really, Ash? You know I'm going to say. The plot thickens as Ashley confronts Seth about the apparent double standards. She probes into the intricacies of spending $880 questioning how bad it could be. Seth, in classic sibling fashion, argues that his purchases are all about resale value, a concept he conveniently forgets when it comes to Ashley's shopping habits. According to him, he's the revenue guru. You are just a hypocrite. She was just being ridiculous. I just want her to stop talking. Ash, what do you want from me? Apologize to me. Apologize? Apologize that you're such a hypocrite. You know what, Ash? I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you're a bitch. F you, Seth. You're such an ass. I am not going to forget the situation anytime soon. Seth better watch his back. Things heat up as Ashley demands an apology. Seth takes a nosedive into being the ultimate a-hole, apologizing for an $880 buy. <laughs> oh no. Instead, he hits her with a sorry not sorry for her supposed attitude, topping it off with a charming label. Well, let's just say that it rhymes with which. Sibling rivalry reaches a whole new level on this show. Two guys out here that are saying they were scammed out of their laptops, and that whoever did it is working with one of our guys. You want to come on and talk to him? All right. Thank you. Who is it? Les is hit with some unexpected news. A few guys claim that they've been pawned by a girl from the staff. Les, ever the detective, approaches the situation with a mix of suspicion and humor, wondering aloud if he's either unintentionally swindling customers or if bizarre customers have taken up a new form of thievery. Tell me. She pawned two of our laptops, and she told us she was going to bring them out to the back. Okay, wait, so you pawned something? Yes. She had to take it to her. Why did you pawn it? Today. Today. Okay. She had to take it to her. And the money? Yes. 
These two kids come in and talk about have some girl pawn two laptops. The plot thickens as two disheveled DJs step into the scene, laptops held hostage. The atmosphere turns somber as the weight of the situation sinks in. It's a strange occurrence that has everyone wearing expressions of confusion and concern. Les, with his seasoned cool, casually queries about the laptop's ownership, revealing they're registered under the mysterious girl's name. Put the money three ways, and one of my employees was gonna walk it out the back door. Either this is a new way for my employees to steal from me. To contact the owner because we want to. I am the owner. I'm just trying to switch the ticket so she can't have it. And it's in her name. The tension rises, but Les doesn't crack under pressure. Maturely handling the situation, he asserts that he needs the lowdown to work his magic and get those laptops back where they belong. It's a pawn shop mystery, and Les is the detective determined to unravel the peculiar case of laptops and loyalty. Because your sign is saying that I can get 30 days of free cash. If you're a new customer with us, first 30 days, you can get interest-free loan. You only pay a dollar per store. But it's saying if I brought a friend with me, then I can get 30 days of free cash. It's for an interest-free loan. Okay, so there came a woman at the counter. Let's see what she's going to come up with. Is she asking for free money? I think she might possibly be mad, though it is kind of funny that she's got enough courage to come up and ask for money without investing anything. Now, the lady at the counter frowned and asked her if she paid or not. Intriguingly, she hasn't paid anything, but she's still asking for money. Uh, holy shit, what's wrong with some people? You're just misreading it. No, it's you're your misreading that's not what the f y'all saying to say, bitch. It says I get free cash for 30 days in this motherfucker. And I get no free cash. What does it say? Who told you we get it next? You didn't. I'm not talking to you. I need my cash. I need my cash. It says it right here. Free cash. Oh, and to make matters worse, she started shouting at her. Everyone around started looking at her, wondering what the hell was going on. Seth and Les get a little furious as everybody's just standing around trying to figure out what's going on. She started bullying her, but the lady tried to explain to her again that she misunderstood the agreement and they're not just going to give her free cash. But this lady's just not listening to anybody. Well, Seth then enters, so who knows what's going to happen now. If you get a loan and you refer a friend, you can get 30 days, interest free. That doesn't mean we're just gonna hand you cash. Who do you have to pawn? Come on now, you gotta have the pawn. I'm the one no screaming, can you read? Read what no, it says. I can read, I can read. People are waiting to get the Les entered and asked her whether she read the whole document or not, and she was not listening and constantly arguing and pointing to them as if they had done something wrong. Meanwhile, other women decided to intrude, and oh my god, it's gonna be funny. Looks like they've all decided to have a fight in the pawn shop. Wonder how that's all gonna end. And it looks like Les is gonna join in too. The other woman that just jumps in the middle. All you need to do is read. Uh, now see the other women get in and start shouting at her as everybody behind her was waiting for her to get out of the queue. So they started fighting and now they're all having an immense fight. Everybody around is watching and laughing at them. Well, the guard had to go and break everything up. Well, at least they're all going to get treated the same way, especially the one who created the mess. Pretty sure they're going to hold them up and throw them out. And there they go. They're still shouting and fighting with each other as well. They really wanted to go at it, so we let them go at it in the parking lot for a little minute. All I saw was ass cracks and elbows. They were sent outside and they started beating on each other, holding each other by their hair and They beat the crap out of each other and people around them were just watching and waiting and having a curious but funny conversation about their nonsense. Let's talk about a hella cringe episode. Okay, so there's a guy coming into the pawn shop with something in his hand, maybe a poster. But what's it for? He came to Seth and the other man and showed them this poster. Now it feels like they're interested in it, and there might be a handsome deal between them. Detroit Lions players had signed. Did you drag it in? Uh, so during the flood, I seen it down there, and that's when I pulled it out. She went down there, she supported these people, and while she was walking the picket line, she would have gathered signatures. You got Williams over here. That's what Steve. 
This is the first time a guy actually brought in and just got on the picket line because I'm on strike right now myself. We've been on strike for almost three months now. Thousand dollars. He started describing the poster that's mainly about the protest of people in history, and it's got lots of signs of well-known people and has got a lot of worth. He explained everything in one go and demanded a heavy amount for it as it was really valuable to him. Seth told him that it's got some stains on it, and it's no doubt the same poster of historical strike, which made it worthy, but for him, it might make a lot of difference. I hate the condition of it. I understand, and I gotta understand when it comes down to collectors, everything is about condition. Absolutely. And I'm sure if your, your dad saw this, jump on the heartbeat. Seth and the man explained that it's not about the worth that he's asking for in terms of thousands of dollars, but it's also about the condition of the poster, and it's not in a very good one. The man is continuously arguing that it's got signs all over it. If Les has seen it, that he'll definitely be surprised and definitely pay more than a thousand bucks. Well, as for Les, he just came in. Sharper, they need to make an effort. We close these deals quickly. Through my research in that, I seen personally that one just like this, Mento, and he got nine hundred fifty dollars for it. Right, so if that was me, why would you want a thousand for this? He only had one signature. I have at least a dozen. But with this tear up here, yeah, and, and the, the condition it's in, the, the, the water stain on the bottom, it's just a hard thing to sell. Yeah, but even though it's in this condition, how many of you exist? Very rare, yeah. and it's uncertified. Right. You know, I'll sell for five. Let's judge the entire piece and told them that he's asking for too much. And later on, they further described that it's torn from the top and the bottom. And it's also got damage and they can't pay more for it. But he still won't agree to pay for it. But he did say that he'd charge $500 off of the amount, but they couldn't reduce it any further. Value, let's make a deal. 75 bucks? No, no way. Who's gonna buy it from you? I'll just put it back in my basement, let it collect dust. Offering you just $100 cash money right now wouldn't make a difference, you're saying? 200. Nobody in life is ever gonna offer you more than us. According to Seth, it's a historical and cool piece and might be a profitable deal for them. So he asked the man if they'll pay 750 bucks for it. But the man was stunned and said that they're paying too little. He said that you should pay more, but Les is arguing that no one can pay you more than this. You change your mind, we'll honor the hundred. Which would you prefer, 520s or a hundred dollar bill? 520s seems like more, wouldn't it? 520s. What's to me? 520s right now. Hundred hours, take it or leave it. 520s. Five got a deal. deal. Hundred bucks. Thank you. All right, bud. Thank you. There is no question, it's a one-of-a-kind piece yet. It's a little bit of damage on it, but it's got a lot of autographs. I know we're going to make a profit. He asked for $200, but no. It's not going to be a good deal, and they told him to lean. The man in need got a severe shock and held up the poster thinking. Les again said that they can't pay more than 100 bucks, And after some time of quietness, they agreed to the deal. Finally, the happy deal was made. This the guy? Right there. Here they come again. Les? Hi, how are you? I am attorney Kyle Dupuy. So there's a man, probably an attorney with two ladies along, coming inside towards Les at a pawn shop. Now, Les knew about it before. He asked for Les, and fortunately, he was at the counter. He asked why they had arrived at the store. He's retained me to represent her in regard to a ring. Okay. My client brought in a $10,000 ring here, and she wants to either collect the remaining money owed to her on the ring or get the ring back. She's got a receipt. Let me explain right here. to you. This is a counterfeit ticket. He said that he came here for the ring, which they bought from these ladies for $10,000. But they didn't pay and gave them the receipt. Now, he put up the receipt and showed it to Les and accused them of cheating and stealing from the women and taking their expensive ring. But Les was cool and controlled his anger. The scene, the scene. Whoever produced this ticket didn't understand this is the amount of numbers that are here. Okay. Number two is state law mandates that we print the law in a 12-point font. Okay. This is much smaller. That is some bull****. It may be bull****. But that's the truth. I don't know how I got mixed up. But There's the game-changing point. Les, after listening to him, explained that he will reveal the truth now by showing the real receipt that they had. He went and came back with real receipts that they've been giving to the customers. There, he spotted major differences. He notified him of the major changes in the receipt that he brought. The man looked rather weak and stunned in response. Printing wrong or whatever, but this is the ticket he got from here. He didn't get it from him. He didn't yeah. get it from him. So now we just like, just I'm in. not saying that you are. Oh, so you're trying to say my son a lie. I wish I had better news for you, but that's bull. That's bull. 
numbers don't match up. The paper stack doesn't match up. This is a fake. Stack. No, you said with them. You're not representing us. I'm representing if I don't you, get my yeah. ring or my money for them, how you gonna get paid? The attorney turned to the women, but oh my god, they're still accusing Les of having given them the wrong receipt and asking the attorney to take the money from Les. The man, being down on himself, as you can see, argued with. Them. The man showed the evidence to the ladies and told them that they were having the wrong receipt, but they continued to argue. The ticket, how about that? Nah, I, I don't believe that the store gave me this ticket. Nah, well, I don't yeah. believe you a real attorney. Yeah. We ain't got a, right. This oh, this you, might you, better you give me people, my money. These, yeah. these my you attorney. Know. You, him, security. The ladies started harassing both of them and started using personal attacks. They were all arguing amongst themselves. <laughs> Pretty crazy. The attorney went back as he can't do anything for the ladies. How are you? I'm doing okay. What can I help you with? Either trying to get a loan on it or you guys can buy it. Mm -hmm. Trying to sell it for maybe like 150 50 bucks. Why is it $50? The certificate and everything is in there. And the bag costs actually way more than that. Well, if I mean, you can you know, tell, it's actually stained. Okay. All through here. I'm trying to sell it for $150 or get a loan for $75 instead of the 50 Yeah, I wasn't interested in more than 50 If you know purses, then you know the As our unsuspecting customer strolls into the kitchen at Chaos, little does she know what's cooking today. Ashley, patiently bracing herself for another round of absurdity, politely inquires about what the customer's looking to offload. The girl, blissfully unaware of the purse's actual value, confidently suggests a price that's almost a steal. It costs way more than Okay, but I'm not going to pay you for the amount that you think it's worth because it's stain. This is not one of the newer ones. This is not this season. I know about purses. It was porn. It was stained. It's not even the last season's bag. Thing is old. But you still willing to buy for $50 though. So if it wasn't worth And now the plot thickens. The lady asserts that if Ashley truly understood purses, she'd gladly accept the offered amount. However, Ashley standing firm in her claim that the purse is torn and not worth more than 50 bucks creates a hilarious clash of valuation difference. We even say $50. So they didn't say it wasn't worth Can I talk to somebody else? I don't want to talk to your pepperoni looking at. Can I get somebody My else? pepperoni looking at. Pepperoni ass? I don't even know what that means. She take a look at her own ass? Can I get somebody else to talk to? It don't even matter. I don't have to talk to you. And I don't have to talk to you either, so why don't you go home? Leave Can I store. talk to somebody nope. else? Why do I have to talk to you? Because you disrespectful. I'm, I'm disrespectful and you call me a pepperoni ass? Ugly ass bitch. F you. And it's time to cue the drama. Ashley throws out the bold figure of 50 bucks, and it hits the customer like a curveball she wasn't ready for. Feeling the heat, our lady teeters on the edge of diplomacy and blurts out the unforgettable line. She labels Ashley a pepperoni ass and decides that she'd rather chat with anyone but her. Talk about spicing up negotiations. Three males walked into a pawn shop. One of the suspects stood at the door as a lookout while the other two suspects walked directly over to the display cases. So, like, these three guys roll into the pawn shop just casually strolling in. The other two guys, they head straight to the fancy display cases. It's all got suspicious vibes. And then, bam! One of them whips out a sledgehammer and starts smashing the glass. Things are starting to get pretty wild. At some point, a customer from the place is seen leaving calmly while the lookout tells her to hurry up. The suspects appeared to be wearing heavy-duty gloves in order... At one moment, a person from the shop strolls out all calm, and someone's keeping an eye on her, urging her to speed up. The people thought to be involved seem to have on these tough gloves, maybe so they don't get any cuts. Not to get cut while removing the glass from the cases. Both suspects placed the jewelry and many other valuables in the bags. So when they took off the glass from the cases, both of them put the jewelry and lots of other valuable stuff into bags. After that, they hightailed it out of the store in a black mercury marquee. Case at? Where the case at? Where is it at? We'll take it. Where he put them on? Guy storms into the pawn shop, all worked up, and starts shouting about a missing case. He's demanding to know where it is, and he appears to be accusing the staff of removing. The feeling of stress in the air is increasing, and it's obvious that something is wrong. Hey, He's accusing us of taking games out of his unit look at the ticket it never said with game the atmosphere gets even more intense as the guy accuses the pawn shop of messing with his games unless the cool guy at the pawn shop stands his ground the customer is getting more agitated making accusations and even talking about blowing up the place which is just adding to the chaos I'm going to do it. 
After all the stress I have, the last thing I need is a customer causing a scene. Despite the escalating situation, Les stays calm. He tries to talk sense into the upset customer, especially with a big event coming up the next day. I know how the mother walk. I ain't illiterate because I potted a wheat and y'all motherfuckers in my middle and putting them motherfucking games in there. And you wasn't even standing there when I posited it. So I need to blow this place up. It's time to go, sir. You ain't gonna get my weed off. I'm not let go. Let go. Can I get my weed? They'll get it for you, don't worry. You're making a threat like that? The situation becomes alarming when the upset customer makes a threat to blow up the place. Les, rightfully concerned about the safety of everybody, asks the guy to leave. Security becomes a priority, and the customer's demand for his belongings takes a back seat to the potential danger that he's creating. That's a challenging moment for Les, who's just trying to manage the chaos caused by an irate customer. How's it going, man? What's going on, man? Everything good. How about you? I'm doing good. Man. Good. What can I do for you? Let me get this like 400 for this watch right here. What can I do for you today? Can I get like 400 for this watch right here? It's worth a 20. Les, chilling at the pawn shop, notices a guy walking in, watch in hand. Les, being friendly, asks how things are going. The guy hopeful wants 400 bucks for his watch. Les, the cool pawn detective, calmly discusses the watch's worth, revealing it's valued at about 82 bucks. You know, right, tell me the truth. What'd you really pay? Tell you the truth, man. Yeah, Come on, give me, fold, give me fold for this watch, oh, man. Be, Come on, man. We deal in high-end watches. This was worthless. Nothing for us to deal with. Come on, give me like 450 for this my watch, yo. Oh, I got a baby on the way, dog. Congratulations. I'm sick, living, I'm sick living at the crib, man. My girl on my the negotiation heat rises as the guy insists on 400, but Les suggests seven. The guy pleading and sharing his life story about a baby on the way asks for 400 again. Les stands firm, offering him the same price, which leads to a bit of yelling. The guy, feeling frustrated, calls the place bull ass and expresses his discontent. You want $10? I don't want to do with $10. I have no idea. Go to Coney Island. Give me $10. I don't know $10. The tension escalates, and the guy feels disrespected, using strong words and even threatening less. Less staying cool suggests maybe he should have been given 400 bucks, hinting at a broken lamp that needs payment. The situation gets intense, with the guy considering if he should have taken the deal. Cash for this watch, man. 400. I'm sorry. This a ass place, man. This whole ass place, boss. Uh, excuse me. You call what? Hey, you call him a bitch? You? I'll knock you the out. You know who you talking to? Tell me. Yo, don't touch me, homie, dog. Touch me, dude. Then maybe he would have been able to pay me for the lamp that he broke. Yo, I'm off with you, dog. The guy, still upset, leaves the shop, but not without some fiery words. Les reflects on the encounter, realizing maybe he should have given 400 bucks to avoid the chaos. The drama ends, leaving behind a mix of emotions and a used watch. Life at the pawn shop remains unpredictable and full of surprises. How are you doing today? Hey, pretty good. How are you? Real good, thanks. I'm Les. Les? I'm Randall. How are you? Randall. Oh, you got a hell of a grip. Wow. What the hell is it? Call it a ring. Okay. I didn't think it was a bus. Um, how'd you get it? I just got it. This guy smelled like a brewery. Okay. How much did you want? I'd like 500 for it. Why? Why? Because I need it. I, I, I got you. two DUIs. A person walks into the pawn shop, catching Les's attention. Things start getting interesting right away. The person wants $500 for a ring and shows it to Les. Les, being curious, asks where the ring came from and why they want to sell it. The person gets really mad when Les asks questions. The intensity in the air rises as the person angrily explains why they're selling the ring. Les stays calm, making it a surprising and dramatic moment in the pawn shop. Well, if it was gold, I'd give you more than 500, but it's not real. It's not. I know it's worth $500 and you're gonna give me 500. Well, actually, if this was gold, but it was brass. It had no value. I understand. You have court issues. The problem is, I need $500 for I'm it, sure please. you do. Man, I, I don't know why. 
As the conversation continues, Les drops a bombshell. He tells the person that if the ring were real gold, he'd offer a whopping $2,500. Feeling a glimmer of hope, the customer suggests, just give me the $2,500 then. Expectantly awaiting a positive response, Les, with a touch of humor, reveals the harsh reality. He explains that the ring is fake, not even worth $500, and he won't pay that much for a counterfeit ring. You gotta give me something for it. I can't give it to you. I'm give it to me anyway. Man, you can give me something for it. No, 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 you give me something just don't for it. on the glass. This guy was drunk. You give me that ring back. It's give me the, that. It's the, it's the. Ow, I ain't going nowhere. Man, get away from me. Yeah, I got me. You man. In the midst of the ring discussion, a security guard quietly enters, taking a position behind the customer. The customer, desperate, pleads with Les to give him something for the ring. But Les, staying true to his detective skills, rejects the plea, emphasizing the ring's fake nature. Les, sensing trouble, comments that the customer seems drunk, adding another unexpected twist to the escalating situation. As the rejection sinks in, the customer, unable to contain his frustration, sits on the floor declaring that he won't leave. The tension peaks as he becomes increasingly aggressive. The guard steps into action, forcefully dragging the defiant customer out of the store. But despite being escorted out, the customer continues to yell and make a scene. Oh boy. I see you sweating. Yeah. It must be hot outside. No, I was doing karate outside. You are doing karate? I do though. I'm Bruce Lee's sister. Really? Yeah. As the door jingles, a woman strolls into the pawn shop, rocking winter clothes in the summer heat. Now she's chatting with Les, teasing him about the sweltering weather. She even claims to be a martial arts pro, throwing around Bruce Lee's name. The banter kicks off with a request for a karate move demonstration. <laughs> She said she was Bruce Lee's sister. <laughs> um, so what you got? The atmosphere takes an unexpected turn when the woman unveils a unique item, a mysterious fox mink. Less unfamiliar with such creatures engages in a lighthearted conversation to understand more about this fox mink. The woman, with a hint of mystery, reveals her intention to sell it. A mink fox? I don't know. I don't I'm not a into animals. Fox. Um, I've heard of fox. I've heard of mink. Um, so fox mink. Did you want to pause? As the conversation unfolds, Les dives into the details of the fox mink, trying to grasp its worth. The woman shares anecdotes about the origins of the item, painting a vivid picture of its history. Les, playing the role of the detective, subtly negotiates and gathers information to figure out the best deal. How much did you want for it? 50000 The encounter concluded with the woman deciding to part ways with her fox mink. Les, using his seasoned charm, finalizes the deal. The quirky tale of the winter-dressed woman and her unique pond item adds an unexpected twist to the usual pawn shop routine, leaving both parties with a memorable experience. Woman comes in to sell me a high-end bottle of liquor. Is that what you're saying? You have no respect. When you want when to take the person 12, when they die, fit the liquor inside the bottle. And anytime you're going to be little person. Damn, I didn't believe you. As the door chimes, the woman confidently walks in, clutching an empty liquor bottle. She aims for a bold move, attempting to pawn the bottle for a cool hundred bucks. Less with his discerning eye, swiftly rejects the proposal, explaining that a filled bottle would fetch a better price. The woman, not thrilled with the response, raises her voice, demanding respect and expressing her discontent. I'll give you a hundred dollars. Not worth more than a hundred bucks. Especially when you say I wouldn't give you a hundred dollars. Don't you ever walk up to my dad. Hey, baby, don't point your finger. Life after this, man. Don't you dare ever come in here again. In my face. I don't okay. care you're in my dad's store, and don't you ever think about coming in here again. You know Turn your ass around. Badass out the door now. Nowhere actually steps up like a superhero. Now she doesn't just cool things down, she straight up shuts the woman down. With confidence, Ashley tells her to leave and never come back. Suddenly, the chaos turns into quiet thanks to Ashley's quick and firm action. Son of a bitch. Where the hell is he? Rich. He's on the floor. People are waiting to pay us for their merchandise. He's not there. We're losing money. 
I'd had Rich's bed. In the heart of the pawn shop, Les faces a moment of frustration and disbelief. The absence of Rich, a trusted ally for over two decades, leaves Les feeling betrayed. The urgency of customers waiting to make payments adds to the tension, and the weight of loyalty becomes a central theme in this unexpected turn of events. And since the first day he came here, over 20 years ago, I feel betrayed. Didn't I just have an employee meeting to tell everybody that they need to step up on their game? I'm watching you and Bobby J talk to these two girls. You're there trying to sweet talk them, trying to bull with them. I'm looking for you in layaway. Where the hell are you? I got to sit in layaway all day long and just wait for something to happen. As the minutes tick away, the atmosphere inside the pawn shop grows more intense. Les reflects on his long-standing support for Rich, highlighting his sense of loyalty that spans a quarter century. He recalls a recent employee meeting where he emphasized the need for everyone to step up their game. Disappointment and frustration seep into his words as he confronts the situation, a pawn shop mystery intertwined with personal and professional loyalties. I'm watching you and Bobby J talk to these two girls. They're out there trying to sell their jewelry. You're out there trying to sweet talk them, trying to bull with them. They end up walking out the front door. You put me in a position that you are the next to go. In this pivotal moment, Les delivers a stern warning to a fellow employee, Bobby J. The scene unfolds with Les observing interactions and attempts at sweet talking customers. The threat of terminal looms as he recounts the consequences of letting down the team. The dialogue underscores the severity of the situation and the potential impact on job security. Tension rises as Les grapples with the repercussions of the unfolding events. Rich, I'm out. Tell your data. Oh. You up your job. As the confrontation escalates, Les draws a line in the sand. The ultimatum is clear compliance or termination. The final seconds capture the raw emotion and frustration of a loyal employee who feels unappreciated and misunderstood. He knew he was in trouble once we walked through that door. Joe, what did you steal from me? Tell me the truth. Inside the pawn shop, a sense of trouble looms as the head of security, Joe, faces a difficult moment. The air is heavy with anticipation as accusations are laid out. In a tense exchange, the truth emerges when Joe admits to stealing. The weight of the admission sets the stage for the unraveling of a trusted employee's actions. The detectives call up uniformed officers to put the cuffs on. And then he reaches into his pocket and pulls out an assortment of jewelry worth over seven as the admission hangs in the air, the situation takes an unexpected turn. Detectives call in uniformed officers to apprehend Joe. A place built on trust is now shaken to its core as the true extent of the betrayal unfolds. You go this way. This is my loyal employee, my head of security, guy that I trust. The arrest unfolds and reality sinks in for the pawn shop owner. The disbelief is evident as a devoted employee, the head of security for the previous three years, is carried away in handcuffs. The emotional weight of the betrayal is clear in the owner's voice, which expresses the anguish of putting trust in someone who later proved dishonest. As the scene unfolds, questions linger in the air. The owner ponders the possibility of Joe working with someone else, leaving the situation shrouded in uncertainty. The aftermath of the betrayal raises concerns about potential accomplices and adds another layer to the unfolding drama. The final seconds leave the audience in suspense, contemplating the true extent of the security guard's actions. Are you her customer or mine? I'm talking to you. Come on. This lady got so irate because she wanted to be next in line. She wanted to be first. She felt that she was the most important out of every customer. You're next in line, so I'm going to be right with you. Okay, well, come on. It doesn't matter. What the f are you? You're not the police. I can talk to whoever the f I want to talk to. How the f what are you going to do? You offer it now. In the opening scene, Ashley is at the counter with a lengthy line of customers. A sudden disruption occurs when a black woman attempts to cut in front of everybody else. Ashley confronts her, asking, what are you doing? The woman becomes becomes upset, but Ashley firmly asserts, you can't do that stuff here. Goodbye. Come yeah, back right. here. Let's talk right now. Take the receipt. What would you like to do with it, ma'am? I want to pay. Well, you have to go to those windows. I'm not, no. I come to this line any other time. Not at this window. Okay, well, I'm not going to stand in the uh, line. 
in the wrong line. Get in the okay, other line. And I'm not going to get in another line. Yeah, I'm going to walk straight up to the damn window. We won't take it. The woman continued standing in line at the counter. Aless approached her, inquiring about the situation. She explained that she wanted to pay, but refused to move to the next window. Les informed her that in the pawn shop, crossing others in line isn't allowed, emphasizing the importance of waiting your turn. Here of you. See this lady here? All the other customers. Okay, and I always come to this line. I'm sorry, you have to stand in the other line. Okay, well, I'll be back before y'all close. You can do whatever you want in this line. She can. Can't wait your turn. We'll be back later. Following the interaction, the woman eventually complied and moved to another window. Les, taking action, instructed the workers at that window not to accept their payment. He firmly directed the woman to wait in line like the other customers, reinforcing the shop's policy on fair and orderly transactions. Thank you, sir. We you know, no, you know, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, jackass. Take your bitch. Take your yeah, that's you. Get it to you. you make me. Make we don't, sir, we don't really? want this. You can take this stuff. Sir, sir, listen, don't listen. I don't know what the problem was. As the interaction begins, the customer expresses gratitude, but the tone takes an unexpected turn. Tensions rise as the customer's language becomes confrontational. The shopkeeper, addressing the situation calmly, refuses to tolerate mistreatment. The dynamics shift from appreciation to conflict showcasing the challenges of customer service in a brief yet intense moment. Came in here, tried to spend my money, is what I did. That's what I did. Okay. And come, instead of trying to come in here, I'm not even talking to you. I need a, need a liver transplant. Why? Seriously? They didn't even look at these cards. Sour Patch Kids. The narrative unfolds with the arrival of another customer visibly intoxicated. The shopkeeper navigates the encounter with a mix of tolerance and assertiveness. The customer attempts to engage in banter, revealing signs of alcohol influence. The shopkeeper, unswayed, maintains composure and subtly addresses the situation, highlighting the challenges of dealing with individuals under the influence. Jeff, take him out, please. How would you Man. Man, what the Stop. I can't get one. In this segment, a discussion ensues about cards and a potential liver transplant. The shopkeeper encounters a situation where the customer's intentions are unclear. Misunderstandings arise, and the shopkeeper skillfully navigates the conversation. The dialogue touches on humorous elements while portraying the complexity of communication in a retail setting. What is it, ma'am? Uh, is it? I don't know, you tell me. Man, come on, you the dude with the ponytail? The wife's racking my nuts on the telephone. <laughs> Just tie two earrings in your ears. Does it matter? Just take it off, put it with mine a little bit, and let it get a little bit more weight to it, and go ahead and give me my okay. money. Does that make sense? No, right no. this way. Man, you can't come back. Damn this Go out my way now, one of y'all touch me. I'll break this. I'm more than happy to go to the ends of the earth for you. When you come in like an ass, you be walked out like an ass. The scene takes a surprising turn as the atmosphere shifts. The shopkeeper reassures the customers that, despite challenges, the store is dedicated to going the extra mile for them. The encounter, starting with tension, concludes with an assurance of excellent service. This final part encapsulates the roller coaster of emotions within a brief time frame, showcasing the highs and lows of customer interactions. You just walked today? Man, how you doing, brother? What's the deal on this TV here? Uh, this TV right here is uh, $400. 400 Yeah. I was in here two weeks ago, sold you this mother for 90 bucks. Now you gonna ask me 400 for it, man? In the electronics section of the store, a customer named Robert engages in a conversation about a TV with the store employee. The casual tone sets the stage for what seems like a routine interaction. The customer questions the TV's price, sparking a humorous recount of a previous encounter where he claims to have purchased the same TV for a lower price. Are you kidding me? So you're making a $310 profit off me? Bull man. Can I help you? Who are you, man? I come in here two weeks ago, just like I told this 
gentlemen. Do something with your hair, man. And then y'all gonna sell it for 400? You gonna make that much profit off me? As the dialogue unfolds, the customer expresses dissatisfaction with the marked up price, claiming the store will profit significantly from his purchase. A manager steps in, attempting to resolve the situation. Tensions rise as the customer questions the legitimacy of the price hike and demands a resolution emphasizing the financial disparity between his purchase and the intended selling price. Brother, where's your receipt? Can you not understand English, my brother? No, I can't. I can't, my brother. I don't believe that he wants a TV for nothing. I'll just take the TV, man. Right out this door right sure here. And I'll be gone. I'll let you trust out here so fast. Trust out by who? Who are you? Les asserts his role, introducing himself and trying to understand the customer's concerns. The customer, however, remains skeptical, challenging the legitimacy of the store's actions. The language barrier becomes a point of contention as the customer questions whether the manager understands English. The atmosphere becomes charged with frustration and confusion. Two green miles. You're talking luck, and they're not going to be happy. I ain't going to the door, man. You ain't going to put me on the door, man. I ain't going to know. The customer threatens to take the TV and leave without making a purchase. The manager issues a stern warning, asserting that any attempt to take the TV without completing the transaction will result in immediate removal from the store. The confrontation takes an assertive turn, with both parties standing their ground. First I get this TV. Get damn shoe, player. You got my shoe. You got my money. This joint. This guy was acting like a total baby. He wanted attention and he got it. Despite the warnings, the customer decides to leave the store, expressing discontent with the entire experience. He accuses the store of mistreatment and vows never to return. The situation concludes with dramatic flair as the customer exits, leaving behind a sense of dissatisfaction and a promise never to return. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Oh, well, actually, I'm not doing so good. No? My grandma just passed. I'm sorry. Well, I was, like, hoping to... Okay, so whose ring is this? My grandma's. Oh. So you want to just pawn it, right? Because you want to be able to get it back? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you have anything else? It's not real. What you mean it's not real? It's not real gold. A guy comes in feeling sad and asked Ashley to pawn his grandma's ring, explaining that she passed away and it's all he has. When Ashley checks the ring, she gently says it's not real. Concerned, she asks if he's got anything else, wanting to help him in a simple way. You saying basically y'all sit up there and waste my time talking to you? You don't waste your time. If you have a TV, you can pawn your TV. What the f I look like pawning my TV? Do you have a TV? I need to speak with somebody else because you irritate me flat out. It's acting really erratic and it's making me really nervous. Lower your voice. Don't lower your tell voice. me lower what your to do. Voice. Don't lower put your, your finger in lower my your face. Lower Don't your put voice. your finger. Ashley breaks the news that the ring isn't real. The person gets upset, saying it's not fake. Ashley suggests pawning a TV instead, but he questions why he should. Despite Ashley's efforts, the man gets angrier, repeatedly telling her to lower her voice. Ashley asks him not to point fingers at her face, but he ignores her. I'm trying to the security guard intervenes, slamming the upset person to the ground and then dragging him out of the pawn shop. The situation escalates and the guard takes decisive action to maintain order. Next up, we've got this episode where a heavily muscled individual made his way over to meet Les to complain about equipment he got from the store that got busted. Somebody bought this. This piece of junk I bought in here just a couple days ago it don't work now, it's broken. What is it? A little ab lounger I bought here, man, workout. In the midst of the pawn shop's hustle, a burly customer approaches Les with a complaint. He's upset about a busted piece of exercise equipment, an AV lounger purchased just days ago. Less sticking to the store policy explains that they can only provide an exchange, not a cash refund. Tensions rise as the customer vehemently rejects the idea of an exchange, demanding his money back. They can only hand over another item in place of the faulty one. If you had the receipt, I could give you an exchange, I could give you some. I don't want an exchange because it's probably going to be some again. 
How about you just get my money? As the disagreement escalates, the customer insists on a cash refund, dismissing the option of another item. Les faces a dilemma, stuck between policy and customer satisfaction. The clash intensifies as the customer becomes forceful in his demand for a monetary refund, setting the stage for a heated confrontation. Les could match him word for word without fear. Better be some money. Or no, what? Or what? There's gonna be a problem. Or How about what that? Kind of Les, accompanied by his trusty companion Byron the Snuggle Bear, stands his ground. The customer challenges Les with threats of problems if he doesn't comply. Unfazed, Les maintains his position asserting that the store's policy is non-negotiable. The air becomes charged with confrontation as both parties refuse to back down. As things got superheated between Les and the customer, Byron tried to step in to calm the man down. As the situation reaches a boiling point, Les and the customer engage in a verbal showdown. The customer grows increasingly forceful and Les warns against physical contact. Byron attempts to mediate and calm the customer, but his intervention takes an unexpected turn, adding a new layer of tension to the already heated exchange. The confrontation takes a risky turn when the customer, ignoring Les's warnings, attempts physical contact. Byron, in a misguided attempt to intervene, escalates the situation further. Les stands firm, refusing to be intimidated while tensions continue to rise. Les questions a man's marriage. Les uses a customer's words against her. There's trouble in the office, but Les reminds Seth that he's the boss. Les kicks off the day questioning a man's marriage, using customer's words against her. Trouble brews in the office, but Les asserts his authority as the boss, teaching a disrespectful man a memorable lesson. Les shows that he's not just a pawnbroker, baby. He's a boss in control. Here are savage Les Gold moments. It looks like Les is more interested in this man's marriage than his business. Les woke up this morning with the urge to roast someone, and of all the people he could roast, he picked this guy. Things take an unexpected turn. Now, in a surprising twist, Les dives into the man's marriage, leaving everybody shocked. Les humorously challenges the man's absurd scenario, roasting him in a way that only Les can. The man's attempt to buy an anniversary present with his wife's jewelry backfires, adding a touch of humor to the pawn shop drama. You did a watch for my wife's anniversary. Oh, it's not your anniversary too? Well, yeah, it is mine too. How many years have you been together? 25 years. Oh, okay. How many good ones? So how did you get these? Well, we were going through some of her jewelry. She said, this belonged to my grandma. They're not real. Les posts a customer's watch request, questioning the authenticity of the jewelry. Unfazed, Les detects the fake and confronts the customer's peculiar anniversary gift plan. The customer tries to defend himself, but Les, in his signature style, keeps it real and uncovers the truth behind the fake jewelry. Right, hold on a second. How come the old man wants to buy his wife an anniversary present with her own jewelry? That is one hell of a ridiculous scenario. What this man could have done at this moment is leave. But nope, some of these customers love to start drama. This is older than both of us. It probably is. But it was fake when it was made, and it's still fake. I got Les faces a customer who crosses the line, insulting his family. For the first time, Les takes matters into his own hands, delivering a stern warning. The tension rises as Les draws the line, showcasing a side of him that won't tolerate disrespect towards his loved ones. And? Okay, I've seen your wife. Listen, mother There's two things you don't talk about. What's that? My wife and my family. Oh, yes. now, here's the deal. For a moment, we thought... Two of you. Two of you. Here's the deal. Get out of here. Two of you. I'll hurt you guys so bad. Uh -huh. Sure you will. You better get in the front. Sure you will. Two. In a final showdown, Les lays down the law. With no patience left, he kicks the disrespectful customers out, warning them of dire consequences if they return. Les reveals his savage side, making it clear that disrespecting his family won't be tolerated under any circumstances. Hello, how are you doing today? I'm good, how are you, sir? That's good. Um, I'm on a pound of TV. I can go 100. Excuse me? So here's a guy who wants $400 on a $200 TV. What the f is he thinking? People can help me move my stuff back in my mother's house. 100 is not going to do, sir. I need more than that. But I can't give you more. See, it's a used TV. 
a young man enters the pawn shop seeking to pawn a TV for 400 bucks. Les, the owner, declines the initial offer and counteroffers 100. The guy, explaining his need to move back to his mom's house, expresses that $100 won't be sufficient for his situation. You know, I have to get away. You see this? He did this last night. If, what did yeah, he do to you last I, night? He beat me up last night. You clearly don't see that. See, you know what? <laughs> you want to cause me to lose my mother temper. I try to give him the benefit of the doubt. I thought he had nice skin. He didn't have any bruises on him. I don't need to call security. You don't need to call him. What the f you? The guy made up a story about daily abuse from his roommate, seeking empathy to pawn the TV for his escape. Les remained skeptical, noting the absence of visible bruises, praising the boy's clear skin. In response, the boy, feeling cornered, requests the involvement of security, hinting at a potential dramatic turn of events. What you gonna do? What you from Africa? Oh, okay. Anyway, like I said, can you give me the 400 you We sell them for right. two. Hello, y'all. Y'all hey, so much. Friend. Have a nice day. You. Thank you. You better not see I'm gonna throw this big mother at you. Where the is my key? Les, trying to find a middle ground, offers $125, but the boy declines and insists on calling the guards. Les, unfazed, reveals the presence of the guard behind the boy. The situation ends with the boy taking the TV and leaving the pawn shop without the need for additional security intervention. So how about your fat ass take it off? The f you work here, ain't you getting paid to do this? I look like a butler to you. I don't give a f my f gonna come in here and get this motherfucker. You better. His big ass gonna beat your little ass, yeah. fat bitch. Give me what army. Motherfucker, come from behind this counter. A tense situation arises as a black woman directs angry shouts at a guard. The guard, responding defensively, questions her, asking if he appears to be a butler in a moment of unexpected confrontation. You get back here. So big ass on my way. Get this motherfucking speaker and take it outside. You want me to stop? Take the You brought it in. You're going to take it out. So take it I'm out. I'm not picking that up and taking it outside. Y'all can get your old ass, take ass out of here. Take your ass out of here. I'm going to take this ass out of here, y'all. You're not going to come in threatening my employees. Who going to bring it outside? Despite Seth's efforts to intervene, the black woman continues her relentless shouting. Even another guard struggles to remove her. Suddenly, she notices Les, the owner, standing behind her. In an unexpected turn, she bursts into laughter and mockingly tells Les to leave. We will give you the respect and the decency you deserve, but when you're threatening my family, we throw you out of here. Bitches, life. Taking matters into her own hands, the woman starts leaving, dubbing the guards as Shrek on her way out. The situation takes an unexpected and humorous turn as she adds a touch of sass to her departure. Let's take a look at it. All right. I'm here with my man, and we got in a big argument, and he left me, so I need he to get back home. He left you here? To Hawaii. Oh, really? Where about? Honolulu. Okay. I got a ride from my cousin, so you got to hurry up. There came a woman at Ashley's counter to sell her chain. Now, Ashley's looking at her chain to see whether it's worthy enough or not. She's asking Ashley to hurry up as she has to leave earlier as her spouse has left her alone here. Really? Okay. How much did you need? I was just trying to not this for you to be nice, but... 600. How about that? I got this from one of my aunts in Africa. This is $600. Oh, do you know what it is? It's actually a Tahitian pearl? No, this is from Africa. This is an African pearl. Ashley asked her how much she wanted for her jewelry. Now, the woman said $600, which is a lot more than Ashley was willing to spend, since Ashley said that it's not an African stone, but the woman was arguing that it was. $600. My ticket cost $600. That's how much I need. Do you have anything else? No. Excuse me? No. Ashley told her that they're not African pearls, so it's not worth $600, but far less. It was at this point that the woman started acting rude. Ashley got shocked at her stupidity and rude behavior. Eventually, she started behaving really bad as Ashley got angrier. What's going to happen next? 600 or not? You can't get 600 on this. Okay. And also, don't call me a bitch. So you mean to tell me that this ain't worth a mother thing? 
That's not what I said. It could be worth something. Oh. Okay, can I get five ninety nine? No. Some kind of problem. Okay. Exactly. Can I get six hundred dollars no, a month? Okay, I you get can't five ninety eight. Like seven. Oh, I hear you left you now. But you don't know why. She then warned Ashley to pay her the money for the necklace, but Ashley refused and told her to get out. But this lady wasn't listening. She was continuously bullying and harassing Ashley. Security arrived in the nick of time to help protect Ashley. They asked about what was the matter, and after finding out about the woman resisting and having a hard time with Ashley, they decided it was probably time to get her to leave. Which led to more screaming and shouting and yelling. I'm not leaving no mother. Yes, you are. Oh, no, I ain't. Oh, yes, you are. What are you going to do? Kiss my. Honey, you don't have that kind of money. All right. You. All of y'all. Bitch. If you want some help, talk to us like a human being. I'm leaving. Aloha. Who the they think they is? Them. Which then caused the more security guards to get her out of the shop. But she kept on yelling. The lady would not stop with the screaming and the shouting. Some jewelry for my daughter. Her birthday is only two weeks. For sure. How old is she going to be? She's going to be 12. She's going to be 12. Yep. Do you want a Kleenex? I've got allergies, man. I itch like super bad. I'm not picking it, I promise. OK. We have a heart one. It's really pretty. Can I see it? There came a man to Ashley asking for something to buy for his daughter. Now, he inferred that she's about 12 years old and he wants something interesting for her. But he's constantly picking his nose, which was making Ashley cringe. He's not stopping from doing such cryptic things, but he's constantly doing it in public. Ashley asked him to let her know if there was something he was interested in buying for his daughter. Look at it. How much you want to spend? Like 100, 150. But... 75. Can I touch it though? That's bull. I was charging him like $75 on this watch just to give him a deal so he didn't have to touch it with his snotty hands. Can I see the sanitizer for a second? Now, the man selected a watch, but Ashley didn't want him to touch anything with his dirty hands. She asked him about his range and he said he wants something under 100 bucks, and the watch was 75. The man didn't agree to buy it. Now, Ashley's just getting furious over his silliness. I didn't use sanitizer. Why don't you guys go yourself? I don't even care about the sale anymore. I just want him out of here. Ashley asked him to use sanitizer before touching anything in the shop, but he refused. And this is going to be a very serious problem. They're probably going to have a fight. Ashley got angry and asked him to leave despite no deal. She just wanted him gone. She didn't care for the deal or profit, but just getting him out of the shop. Well, then came the guards who made sure that he left, and Ashley used sanitizer everywhere on everything that he put his hands on. Well, that's it for today, everybody. Thanks for being part of the Hardcore Pawn adventure with us. We hope you like the drama and the surprises. Stay tuned for more pawn shop stories. See you next time. A customer demands a stereo refund, leading to a tense showdown with his brother. Earrings spark a heated confrontation while a frustrated customer faces off over a waiting game. An unproven claim raises tensions and upon negotiation turns sassy, testing the limits. Lastly, a ring appraisal takes an unexpected turn when a wife discovers betrayal, turning our place into a space for some fascinating real life stories. Okay, so check it out. This customer rolls in wanting a refund for a stereo he got from the store. But guess what? It's not in perfect shape like he thought. The store can't do cash refunds, but they're cool with exchanging it for something else. This here? Yes. We just want our money back. The problem is, is I can't, I can't give you a refund. We just don't have that option. I can give you anything else that you want to use. All good, right? Nope, not for the customer's brother. He starts making a fuss, saying they sold his sister a busted thing. Oh, cool, that, man. I mean, that's not cool, situation. man. We want our money. They sold my sister some broken merchandise. He's not feeling pawn shops and thinks they can't get a cash refund. Less, the guy at the store explains the deal, but the brother wants something better without spending more. Problem is we don't refund. That's right on your receipt. So if you'd like to get something else, I have no problem with that. We want something a whole lot better than what we got. Things get tense and Les gives him a choice. Take something else or hit the road. Please. Please. You can take this stuff. Sir, sir, listen. Don't shame. Listen. Sir, no. I will be forced to 
heavy What you mean for a tip? Who, who gonna do so? Brother goes for the drama, yelling and resisting being escorted out. Finally, they agree on a fix, but the guy bursts in again, causing a scene. No, no. I don't know. Hey, why, why don't we come over, yeah, we come over on this side? Let's come on over on this side. Why don't we come over on this side? This time, they kick him out for real, kicking and screaming all along the way. Come on, man. You don't want to be stupid. Hold on, hold on. They'd eventually reached an agreement and the repair was underway, but the man decided to burst in once again to cause a scene. No! Get off me, man! No! Ah! All he got in return was his forceful removal, despite the fact that he was kicking and screaming like a little baby. A woman and her friend enter with hopes of selling a set of earrings. However, things take a confrontational turn when Les, in his characteristic playful manner, tries to strike up a conversation about their intentions for the money. The woman, visibly annoyed, lashes out at Les for prying into her business, setting the tone for a tense interaction. I'm here to pawn these earrings. Okay. Trying to get $350 for them. Why do you need the money? It's none of your business why I need the money. Despite Les attempting to maintain a friendly environment, the situation escalates further. The woman vehemently rejects any inquiries about her personal life, responding with hostility. Why I'm coming in here to handle my business? That's not your business. Why I'm coming in here to do what I got to do? Les, seemingly undeterred, continues with his good-natured questioning, asking about the number of kids that she has, which only adds fuel to the fire. Then to piss her off even more. How many kids you got? I'm coming in here with my jewelry to get money. How many kids you got? She just told you. <laughs> to intensify matters, Les claims to analyze the earrings, asserting that they aren't real diamonds. These aren't real? These are real. They are real earrings. They're just not real diamonds. They are. No, they're yes, not. The, the revelation further infuriates the woman, leading to increased yelling and frustration. Sensing a potential physical confrontation, Byron, another employee, positions himself closer to Les to provide support if needed. As the women realize they won't achieve their desired outcome, they decide to leave, expressing their displeasure with the establishment as they do. Get her hair fixed. Uh, classic people. Supposed to be jury and long. Boy, ass shot. Waggedy mother. Have a nice day. F you bitch. bitch. Thank you. We got this livid customer going on a rant at the pawn shop, claiming he's been waiting for two hours. Been here for two motherfucking hours, man. Then they got 11 windows. You got two, two working. How you doing? I'm finally here, you know what I mean? I've been in the land for like two hours. He managed to get his HD in, but Ashley, the cool and collected employee, is keeping it professional. You get out of here a lot quicker if you just Hold on, what is it. this? What is this? What is what? This ain't what he told me he was going to give me. What did he tell you he was going to give you? The guy's expecting 400 bucks, but Ashley's like, nope, you're getting 110. Our furious friend throws a threat like he's gonna crack heads. You're not getting 400, you're getting 110. Okay, well, you can't give okay, me my 400. Sign that, and I'm not I'll give saying. You, your money. you yes, know sir. what, see, you the type of mother I've been a caught out sad and cracked you up sad, your mother here. Not cool, right? The folks in American Jewelry and Loan aren't vibing with that. Ashley's had enough, lays down the law, and says, respect or no money for you. Listen here, I'm a pimp. I got, I'm a real pimp. I'm a real pimp. I'll put you on your back. I will put you on your back. You don't gotta walk the ball. But this dude, he's got some wild stories talking about women on the street doing things for him. Get your you gonna talk to me. You gonna talk to me with some respect. I got more women on the street out here hustling, doing things for me every night, every day. Well, security's on point, keeping him at bay while he's still talking big. Y'all can't kick me out of here. <laughs> oh boy. Someone's day at the pawn shop just hit a speed bump. Off this motherfucker, man. You feel what I'm saying? I know you just doing your job, big dog, but I drive my with BMW. In another scenario, a woman, believing her husband pawned her $5,000 wedding ring due to financial struggles, approaches Ashley seeking its return. Take it. I was doing my husband's laundry this morning, and I pulled his wallet out. There's a pawn slip from you guys. I put it back in his wallet. However, lacking a pawn ticket or any proof of ownership, the situation becomes complicated. Ashley, empathizing with the woman's plight, requests a police report or any documentation to validate her claim. 
The woman refuses, adamant about not involving the police, and tensions flare. I get why he did it. I just want to come in, pay for it, and get my ring back. You make a police report? No, I didn't make a police report. The hell am I going to make a police report for? I'm not going to call the cops on my husband. I'm coming to you to get my ring back. Facing an impasse, Ashley is compelled to ask the woman to leave. The exchange becomes heated, and Ashley insists on her departure, prompting the customer to leave the store. Your butt out here and you assist me out. Please bring it. That's all I want is my ring. That's it. It is a Take hard. your pretty little feet. Walk your pretty little legs no, out here. You are not. Just go back I'm there not. and give me my How hard is it? You can't just go back there and type in a name? Do you shut up for no. a second? They never shut Get up. Get the hell out of here. No. It's time to go. I'm yours. I'm We've got this customer dealing with some money woes and trying to hustle up a quick hundred bucks by pawning his stuff. Shoes that needed solving post haste. I'm trying to get all my stuff out. So what are you looking to do with that? I'm looking to get a hundred dollars for it to help me out. But here's where the plot thickens. The guy's asking for a Benjamin, but all Seth and Les can dish out is a humble ten bucks. The hell is that going to do for you? $100 will help me move my out. It'll feed Where? my dogs if I have to, wherever I find. Our seller buddy thinks that 10 bucks isn't going to cut it for his grand plans, like moving out and feeding his dogs. You know, fair enough, but that's the best they can offer. He tries to haggle for 50 bucks, but Les shuts it down, giving him a reality check. That's all Seth and Les can offer. What the f do you mean it's going to be a good start? The $10 isn't going to be. Why couldn't you do 50 for this? Because now, here's where things take a wild turn. Instead of just taking the tenor, our friend gets all sassy. Les, not one to take disrespect, drops the cash on the counter, and you won't believe what happens next. Wait, wait, me trying to hand my shit back to me. I'm not having that. No. Are you kidding me right now? The guy refuses to pick up the cash, calling it disrespectful. Or to do this, that's disrespecting you. What the f is your problem? Les, not having any of that nonsense, lays down the law. Pick up your money or hit the road. But our stubborn friend goes all ugh. Pick it up. You want to treat me like a bitch? You're going to be the bitch. Pick my up. Pick my doll up. Are you insane? This dude walks in with a ring, wants an appraisal. But little did he know, his wife was about to unleash some serious drama. Ashley's just trying to do her job, and suddenly, bam, it turns into a full-fledged soap opera. Right here. I also wanted to know how much you guys would give. This dude is literally sweating bullets, and his wife ain't having any of his nonsense. She calls him out for pawning her ring without telling her. What are you doing? He wanted uh, an appraisal on this ring. On my ring? I'm gonna go grab me some popcorn. Cue the drama. Bull Why'd you take my ring? You're a liar. You need to bike parts and didn't have the damn money. And all of a sudden you got my damn ring. Oof, she slaps him not once, but twice. Ouch. Ashley's just standing there probably thinking, what in the pawn shop drama is going on here? Once. I wanted to know how much it was worth, that's all. Why'd you take my ring? I gotta say, no need for security here. The wife's got it covered. She demands to know how much the ring was worth, and the poor guy's just apologizing left and right. The drama here is so intense, it's like a reality TV show unfolding right there on the spot. Couple reaches home. And I am dumbfounded. You're a idiot. Well, yeah, he's the hers. one that gave it to me. That's hers. Just give him the ring. Thanks. Okay, hold on. This customer's on an entirely different level. Picture this, she walks into the shop wearing the coat that she wants to sell. Classic Shannon move, am I right? I'm good, how are you? I'm Shannon. Hi, Shannon. How much would you give me for this? How much you want? At least a thousand. Les asks her how much she's looking for, and Shannon's like, at least a grand. Les throws out a cool hundred, and she loses it, saying she wants more. A hundred for this mother coat? Uh-uh. I want more than a hundred. But she claims the coat's made of fox, rabbit, bird, whatever she feels like saying. Made of. Okay, you got me up. Mm -mm. It's fox. This 
This is a rabbit, a bird, whatever the f I want it to be. So the guys, being who they are, decide to troll her a bit. Unless even pulls in a fur expert who says it's worth a dollar. You gonna give her more than a hundred dollars on that? I will give her more than a dollar. What the f a dollar? A uh, hell? Who the f is he? He's my fur expert. Shannon isn't having it and causes a scene. Security gets involved and she's out the door. Security too? There you go. Oh! Y'all motherfuckers don't know who y'all f with up in here. A female customer arrives claiming that her niece purchased a lovely earring from the store. However, upon closer inspection, she discovered that a diamond was missing. The catch? Mm, you guessed it, no receipt. Without proper proof of purchase, she hoped to return the earring and secure a refund. The diamonds was missing, and I wanted to know, can I get my money back? Keep the receipt? Uh, no. Do gifts come with a receipt? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, well, this one didn't. Ashley, ever the voice of reason, inquires about the receipt, and the customer admits that she doesn't have one. Ashley explains the store's policy regarding cash refunds and, crucially, points out that the jewelry the customer brought in is fake, a type of item the store does not deal with. Tensions rise as the customer becomes impatient, demanding her money or a different pair of earrings. No cash refund. One more problem that's really key to this whole thing. Mm -hmm. These are fake. And we don't sell fake jewelry. Well, it's okay. gonna be Hold some in here. Well, um, excuse me, anybody buying any jewelry from here, don't get no more jewelry from hey. here because this hey. ain't good. Hey, hey. Uh. Bobby J, provoked by the escalating situation, engages in a heated exchange with the customer. I'm talking to him. I'm talking to him. Sir, can you help me? Can you give me my money? Can you give me a different pair of earrings? Anything. No. Oh, wait. No. Your short ass no. gonna tell me. Are you angry because your coat's so tight? No, my coat ain't tight. You so much little back to, there. We can sign the leave. I think it's time for the Ashley attempts to defuse the situation by offering options for resolution or departure. Joe, making his appearance, assists in escorting the unruly customer to the front door. It's time to leave. I'm not going nowhere. I bet you are. No, I bet I ain't. This is Joe. Joe. Uh, He's going to show you to the front door. Wait a mother <laughs> minute. Now get your hands off. I guess. Don't. Bobby J's dealing with customers hunting for an anniversary ring, but the vibe is a little off. I'm going to post my voice, but tomorrow's our sixth anniversary, six years anniversary. Really? Yes. The lady drops a hint about her boyfriend, and the jokes start flying. Six years? Bobby tries sizing up the situation, asking for the boyfriend's ring size. So, what size? Do you know the size that he uh, is, or ring wise? Uh, I thought you were talking about that size. <laughs> I was like, that is too personal now. No, no. Ooh, awkwardness alert. He gets a little too personal, and they play it off. But Bobby's cringing. Store. Now I gotta practice. Now I gotta practice. Now I'm gonna pretend like I'm close to you. Okay. Oh. Oh. Now, here comes the big moment. He's showing them rings, trying to keep it professional, but the tension is building up. In a bold move, the guy decides it's proposal time. Now, Tay Tay, we've been together for a while. Will you marry me? <sighs> On the spot, Bobby's just hoping this affair ends soon. Yeah. All right, that's your four digit pin, followed by the green button, please. Okay. Fine. It's declined. It is not declined. You better on. Uh, it's okay. Hell no, no. Things were strained between them all. Oh, sweet mother of relief. She says yes. But wait, things take a nosedive. The payment goes south. Yeah, Ashley messes up and the lady's not having it. Your oh, ass is gonna give me that much ring. Sir, listen. Sir, sir, sir. Sir, sir. Who are you calling the sir? Arguments escalate, calls for Sir Echo, but it's chaos. They can't calm down. Well, just another day at the pawn shop where love and payments collide, leaving Bobby J stuck in the middle of a ring gone wrong. Who are you now? No, act like a lady. I am, I am acting like a lady, but she gonna, but she gonna sit there and call me. No, she gonna sit there and call me. Oh boy, Ashley's in for a wild ride dealing with this lady trying to get some cash for her outdated tablet. The lady's asking for a whopping 500 bucks, which is like asking for gold when all she's got is, well, something like an iPad. Hello. Hi, how are you? Just trying to get some money so I can bail my man out. Ashley's trying to be cool about it, like, hey, it's not worth that much, not even close. 
She even gives the tablet back, and the ladies acting all offended. Like, serious lady, did you expect a pile of cash or something? How'd you come up with 500? This is a pet. I should be to get like 500 for it. And then here comes the classic move. I need to talk to the manager. But little did she know, Ashley is the manager. Well, cue the surprise, but the lady's still stuck on that $500 dream, and Ashley's like, sorry, not happening. You're not gonna talk? Where's the manager at? Where's the mother manager at in this building? She even offers a friendly tip, like, sometimes what you want is closer than you think, but nope, this lady's not having it. It's me, so if you, you want- the who's, who's over you, man? I want $500. Eventually, Ashley kindly asks her to leave, but what does she get in return? A no, I'm not leaving. So, I'm asking to leave. No! Mine! Run me mine! And run me mine! Huh, classic stubborn move. But hey, Ashley's not having any of it. She even hands her the tablet like a final reminder and tells her that she needs to go. You can leave. No, I'm not leaving! I wish I might This man's refusal to keep his receipt has led him to a dead end, and his only recourse seems to be attempting to intimidate the owner into getting what he wants. Frustrated by the lack of a receipt, he aggressively demands his money back, expressing no concern for the security personnel present. If you had the receipt, I could give you an exchange, I could give you some. I don't want an exchange because it's probably going to be some again. How about you just get my money, and then we won't, you know, we won't have any more problems with this, but I'm I don't not, have I'm any not. problems now. Despite the escalating tension, Les stands firm, emphasizing that without a receipt, there's no possibility of a refund. Not gonna do yes, anything. I'm not gonna and do you, anything. All, all, and you can back off too, man. Like all this uh, security standing around or whatever. I don't give He's a rat's ass my... about that. Well, we don't you know give I mean? a rat's ass either. Like I I'll said, there's no, there's no receipt. There's no money. There better be some money. You know or what, I mean? what? Or what? There's... In a misguided attempt to bully Les, the man overlooks the fact that security, including Byron the Big Snuggle Bear, is right there. Hey bro, you give me the receipt, I'll be more than happy like to Like I said, I don't have the receipt. And I don't have the money. Byron, showcasing his expertise in handling such situations, steps in to restrain the belligerent individual. As the aggressor attempts his first blow, Byron efficiently intervenes, not only preventing any harm to Les, but swiftly escorting the unruly man out of the store. Come on, Come on outside. Come we got on. you, buddy. Bring Let's a go. couple more. Come on. We got you. Bring a yeah. few more. All we need Come on, bring all y'all out here. Come on. So this customer shows up, claiming she's in a rent pinch and wants to pawn her ring. Les cuts to the chase. How much? She shoots for 200 bucks, but Les counters with 80. I was coming to pawn my ring because I have to pay my rent. It was due a couple weeks ago. How much did you want, man? Two hundred dollars. Two hundred. Well, what I can do is I can give you eighty. Eighty dollars. Eighty dollars. I'm not just about to let you have this for eighty dollars. I paid five hundred dollars for this. Now she's not having it, insisting she get paid $500 for the ring. Les tries to educate her on how pawn shops work. They can't offer more than they can make back on a deal. But this lady is off the rails, losing control. She's determined to get what she wants, even if it means crossing lines. Understand? How would you? Ma'am. Ma'am. Les remains unfaced, thanking her for the spectacle that he just doesn't give a you know what about. Thank you. This woman could not keep control of herself. I don't know what the hell her problem was. I don't give a what her. Two men walked into the shop, clinging to a computer system as ancient as they were, expecting a whopping $1,000 for it. Seth, incredulous, thought that they were joking, as the last time he saw such a computer was back in the 80s. Offering a reality check, he mentioned that these relics would be worth around 400 bucks if bought new. About $900. I thought that they were kidding. The last time I saw one of these computers was in the 80s. Um, to be honest, if you bought these new, it's about like 400 bucks. Undeterred, the men insisted on needing more money. Seth, in a straightforward manner, stated that the best he could offer was zero. This did not sit well with the men who seemed poised to start a scene. We need more than that. Yeah, we need more money than that. Um, what I can offer you is zero. However, the unexpected appearance of a security guard quickly changed their minds. Seth attempted to clarify that such computers were considered antiques and that he was trying to help. 
Frustrated, he expressed his inability to deal with them any longer. The men, persistent in their desire for 800 bucks, were met with a resolute zero. Most people don't get that aggravated when they bring in, like, ancient artifacts. Yeah, people want... collect these. Things. Oh, they're antiques now. You don't have to be a smart ass I'm not about trying to be a smart ass. I'm trying to help you give us a thing, man. They thought I was being smart. I couldn't deal with them anymore. We'll take 800. Zero. That's How many times do I need to tell you? No, We're not interested in it. Leave the store. I'm not taking it. Taking it. Store. Guarantee you it's walking out the same time you are. Less than his security personnel escorted the disgruntled duo out of the store, expecting them to leave peacefully. You. Have a good day. <laughs> you and <laughs> you. Thank Wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dropping an item on accident, they blamed each other, prompting a stern reaction from a woman who emerged seemingly out of nowhere. Oh, man! Man, why you break that man? I did not drop it on accident, man. I didn't break it. <laughs> This woman, unafraid and assertive, faced both men as if they were her unruly sons, demanding that they put the broken item in the dumpster. Take that out, you old hippie! Take your ass on out of here! Mind your own business! Tell that Let's you. Be I know you what it is! is. No. That's what it is! Get out of here! Get out of here! Get out of here! Get out of here! Get Alan's taking care of business, baby. I know that's so nice. if you on an otherwise ordinary day, Ashley faces the wrath of an enraged customer who claims his $500 earring is wreaking havoc on his ear. I paid $500 for this uh, earring, and look what it's done did to my ear. Ugh. All fired up, he demands Ashley figures out the issue. But the twist? The earring in question is a fake, and he might have swapped it, aiming to scam the business. Can I get my money out, back? You want me to figure out why your ear's turning a different color? Is that a real diamond? I look at his earring that he says is turning zero green, and it's a fake diamond with a fake metal. Suddenly, he's got a so-called lawyer in tow, threatening legal action. However, this mysterious attorney remains elusive and, frankly, seems fishy. No card, no ID, just a vague promise of an escort. You with me? This is wrong. Show me your card. I don't have a card with me. Well, law from Jurassic It's not important. It is. Defying warnings, the man insists on staying put, accusing Ashley of taking his money. Things escalate, and he's shown the door. But <laughs> oh no, he's not gonna leave quietly, throwing a final jab about his bold earring. This is my attorney. Would you like to meet my attorney? I want my money. My attorney will escort you out. You better not put his hand on me. And you better turn around with your two legs and walk out yourself. Ashley stands firm, and the supposed lawyer, well, he's just a disappearing act. A dramatic day, but Ashley, ah, she's seen it all. Bold earrings, fake lawyers, and the relentless pursuit of truth in the pawn shop drama. What do you mean, get out? Get you don't out. just tell me what to do. Get out. Yeah, you know, took my money. You sold me a bold earring. On what seemed like a typical day at American Jewelry and Loan, an imposing man entered, visibly agitated about a loan on his wife's ring. He complained about being upgraded from a VIP card to a gold card without reaping any additional benefits. I got a problem. I got a loan on my wife's ring. Yeah? And when I first started coming here, I got a VIP card. I got more on the loan. Now you guys put me to a gold card and I get nothing out of it. No, the VIP is the gold. They're both one the same. Seth attempted to address the man's concerns, clarifying that both VIP and gold cards were the same. However, the man was dissatisfied with the loan amount, expressing his frustration. Seth, trying to maintain composure, explained that the ring could be picked up when the required amount was paid. What did you get? It's a 385, and now you're upset. Why? What are you guys going to do about it? I'm going to allow you to pick up your ring when you have the right amount of money. You're not listening to me. I am hearing you, but you're not listening to me. Undeterred, Seth stepped away from the situation, challenging the man who seemed intent on escalating the situation. Oh, you're an idiot. What are you going to do about it? I'm not going to do anything. The man, seemingly eager for a confrontation, attempted to provoke Byron. The man continued to taunt, asking if Byron wanted some trouble and insinuating a potential altercation at his house. Byron, maintaining a calm demeanor, declined the invitation and firmly showed the man the exit. The situation, despite the man's aggressive behavior, was diffused without further escalation, thanks to Byron's swift intervention. Whatever you got to bring. Come on! We're going. 
My house, right here. No, I'm not going home with you. No thanks. That's what I thought, bro. <laughs> you, you thought right. This. Ah! Hello. That's what I thought. This. Here we've got a customer trying to sell an unusual combo of speakers, claiming they're worth a grand. Things like this. To listen to the music. You're gonna barbecue. This is the best. I cook shish kebab. Mm, very good food. When he the gold sibling smells something fishy and decides to investigate. Questions about the speaker's damaged cones and a hint at dumpster diving arise. I think I like a thousand dollars. Really? The customer insists on 500 bucks, making threats if denied. The siblings see through his game and call out his attempts to play him. His accent slips, and instead of admitting defeat, he tries a feeble I'll be back routine, as if auditioning for Schwarzenegger movie. Hey, I have a question for you. Yes, the cones on the speaker. Yeah, what happened to those? This is how I get it. Really? There's really? nothing wrong with it. Where'd you find it? The dumpster? $500, give me. I'm gonna be nice, and that's it. Why? What would happen if we didn't give you $500? you are not gonna be nice? But hey, man, this ain't Hollywood. The gold stand firm, unimpressed by the intimidation tactics. No scare tactics or Arnold impressions are gonna cut it. The customer's dramatic exit promises a return, but the golds, yeah, they're not buying it. I'm gonna get very, very angry right now. That wouldn't be smart. What? What you gonna do about it? Listen, you're Stop not gonna looking scare at him me. Like that. You don't oh. scare me, punk. So what are you gonna do? You don't scare me, I'll be back. Oh, what are you gonna do? I'll be back. What are you, Arnold Schwarzenegger? I'll be back. Go back inside. A couple entered the shop, seeking Bobby J's assistance to upgrade a ring. Excitedly, Bobby J started the process asking about their preferences and suggesting options. I'm looking like to upgrade her ring. Okay. Need something bigger. Okay. Let me see this ring. So you want to I use... can take it off. You want me to take it off? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. That's fine. You want to go with a marquee? You want to stick with rounds? However, tension quickly arose when the woman noticed her companion's distraction and questioned him about somebody named Tina. Who is Tina? Man, you Tina ain't really never gonna do cousin, that? Man. Are you serious? Nobody, Your cousin? Seven years. You ain't never brought up no Tina to me. Why is you tripping, man? Tina's my cousin, man. man. Ain't no damn cousin. I'm not go A heated exchange ensued between them, with the woman attempting to lay her hands on him. Amidst the rising conflict, Bobby J tried to mediate, attempting to de-escalate the situation. The woman, feeling increasingly agitated, emphasized her discontent, declaring that she wouldn't tolerate such behavior. The incident, although intense, highlighted the challenges faced by Bobby J in managing not only business transactions, but also the personal dynamics of some customers. Whatever. What you gonna do? What you gonna do? I ain't playing with you. What you gonna do? No, whatever. He gonna keep playing. Despite his efforts to guide them through the ring upgrade process, personal issues took precedence, leading to a heated confrontation. Les wakes up feeling like a fire-breathing dragon, ready to roast anyone who walks in. And guess who strolls in? A clueless dude looking to pawn some sparkly stuff. Les starts to roast slowly, asking about the dude's marriage. No, oh, big mistake, dude, bro. Out pops this crazy story about anniversary gifts and grandma's jewels. Les smells something fishy, and boom, he calls the dude out on his fake baubles. Finally, they're back to business. Get a watch for my wife's anniversary. Oh, it's not your anniversary too? Well, yeah, it is mine too. How many years have you been together? 25 years. Oh, okay. How many good ones? So how did you get these? Well, we were going through some of her jewelry. Now, any sane person would slink away with their tail between their legs, but not this drama llama. See, he starts spitting insults about Les's wife, which is like poking a grizzly bear with a toothpick. Les sees red and for the first time ever kicks a customer out of his own pawn shop. Two customers, actually. Both of us. It probably is. But it was fake when it was made, and it's still fake. I got an anniversary coming up. I'm not getting in trouble. You're married, right? I am. Okay, I've seen your wife. Listen, mother there's two things you don't talk about. What's that? My wife and my family. Oh, okay. so here's the deal. The air crackles with tension, but the other customer just chills like a cucumber. Guess drama ain't their style. This ain't some Hollywood brawl, folks. This is a pawn shop smackdown, with Les unleashing his verbal fury and two dudes getting escorted out faster than a bad burrito. 
Go. Two of you. Here's the deal. Get out of here. Two of you. I'll hurt you guys so bad. Uh -huh. Sure you, know, you will. You better get the front. Sure you will. Two people. It's evident that the Gold siblings don't have the best relationship, and in this particular episode, Ashley decided to interfere with a potentially profitable deal for Seth. The customer brought in a valuable 1970 Detroit Tigers autographed baseball, hoping for a fair deal. How did you get it? My grandfather left it to me. This is a great collector's piece. It's signed by not only L. K. Line but Norm Cash. For the right price, I'll be able to make a huge score on it. Seth, recognizing the item's value, was negotiating smoothly until Ashley barged in, disrupting the flow. Ignoring the potential earnings, she proposed a mere $250, significantly lower than the customer's expectations. Seth, aware of her intentions to provoke a conflict, tried to salvage the situation, suggesting a more reasonable $500. Looking to have a good time down south. Yeah, but you're not bringing me something that's worth about $1,500. To me, it's worth more than that. But well, why? You're not an avid uh, Tigers fan. What have you got here? I've got a 1970 Detroit Tiger autographed baseball. Um, how about 250? $250? No way. No way. Ashley persisted with her lowball offer, causing confusion and frustration for the customer. Instead of addressing the customer needs first, the siblings engaged in a heated argument, making a spectacle of themselves. Ashley's refusal to understand the item's value and insistence on her insulting price only added to the chaos. Ultimately, the siblings missed an opportunity to make a profit, showcasing their relationship. How about 500? No, it's gotta be higher. I said 250. I'm at 500. Do you know who signed that ball, Ash? It's not worth the 1500 he wanted. Can I have my ball back? Do you wanna give him his ball back? Or do you wanna act like a I total don't know. ass? I wanna spit out another price that would really insult him. Are you serious? You can't close a deal. You just don't know how to close a deal. I close every deal. I close every deal. This lady stomps in demanding stuff her way, unless he ain't playing patty cake. He throws her own words back like boomerangs, leaving her flustered and spitting curses. Hurry up, I gotta be at work, she screeches. Less cool as a cucumber, calmly says. Come back when you got time, or maybe someone less yelly can help. <laughs> Bam! One punch, straight to her rudeness. Please. Well, I gotta be at work at 3 o'clock, so please. Ma'am, do you wanna come back when you have more time? Can you get somebody else to uh, serve me? Yeah, yeah. When you're screaming at me, I'm not gonna speed up the process. How many more times did I tell you? Yes, I want my store cutting. A couple more times. Well, I guess Just so, because she showed now listen. Just a couple times. I hope you have fun with your sauce and help burn with you when you have burn it. Oh, but this lady, no, she ain't backing down. She throws around threats like confetti, wishing fire and brimstone on Les. Now, Les ain't no saint, but nobody deserves that kind of abuse. He shuts her down quickly. I won't be disrespected. Boom. Another verbal jab from the man himself. Burn with you when you burn. When she talks about when I die that I'm going to rot in hell, I'm not going to allow anybody to abuse me like that. The air crackles with tension, thick enough to slice with a butter knife. This ain't your average pawn shop squabble. This is a war of words with Les standing his ground against a hurricane of rudeness. This guy ignored Les's repeated warnings not to touch the merchandise, displaying a complete disregard for basic rules. Les, trying to prevent any mishaps, urged him multiple times to leave the items alone. Hey sir, don't touch it, put it down. It's okay to be curious, but leave it down there. Les emphasized. Despite the clear instructions, the dude continued to ignore him, insisting on inspecting the merchandise up close. Hey, hey, sir, don't touch it. Sir, sir, what? put it down. I told you not to pick it up. But how am I gonna see if it's gonna work? The man retorted, challenging Les's authority. But rather than apologizing, he confronted Les, questioning his approach. It's 300 hours. Hey, sir, just leave it down there. But I'm trying to, how am I gonna see if it's gonna work? I told you not to pick it up, didn't Isn't that what I just told you, sir? Les, maintaining his composure, reminded him, I told you not to touch it. You're not one of your kids. The man, unfazed, continued his confrontational stance, underestimating Les's authority. You got a piece listen of to that I pick up. I told you me. not to touch uh, it. You know, I'm not one of your kids. You're going to raise your voice. You're all badass when you're back there and he's over. 
Byron, the security guard, intervened, warning the man that he was fortunate to have someone there to prevent further issues. The man sarcastically remarked, Oh man, am I lucky? It's my lucky day! Showcasing his lack of remorse. Hey, you're lucky you got somebody here. Oh man, am I lucky? Yeah. It's my lucky day! Yes. Oh, oh, the Pawn Star shop is about to erupt like a volcano fueled by testosterone. Seth, fresh-faced with new ideas, tries to change Les's security rules like their yesterday's newspaper. No, oh, but Les ain't having it. He reminds Seth who wears the crown, who built the damn empire, and who ain't about to back down from a pipsqueak. What the hell are you doing? You tell my guys after I set policy that the policy is being changed to your old bull ways? You gave them each a department? Yeah, doesn't it make sense? Doesn't that make sense. Talk to them. What do you mean it belongs to them? They, they own it. They can own it. Well, I can run this place better. I know exactly what needs to be done. Who the hell are you messing with? Les roars. I set the rules and you change them after five minutes? You think you own the place? Newsflash, Sonny. You work here. You don't rule here. <laughs> Seth, puffed up like a peacock with borrowed feathers, sputters back about running things better. Now he wants Les to kick back, retire, and hand over the keys. But Les? <laughs> he laughs in Seth's face. Classic. That Seth needs to chill out. Let me tell you something. How dare you to talk to me like this? The air crackles with tension. Insults fly faster than bullets in a John Wick movie. Seth throws out accusations, calling Les outdated and stubborn. Les counters with jabs about inexperience and disrespect. This isn't your grandma's bake sale argument, folks. This is a heavyweight brawl of egos, pride, and power. Now taking all bets. Either I make the wrong decisions, I'm the one that brought us here. You need to retire, and I need to take over. Maybe Seth needs to listen to the wisdom and experience Les has, not just try to shove him out the door. And maybe Les needs to give the young blood a chance to prove himself, not just dismiss him as a naive newbie. Ashley and Seth, despite being siblings, have a history of constant clashes. In this instance, Seth decided to initiate a confrontation, leading Ashley to seek intervention from their father. Why don't you put it in the back and stay back there? You're just buying junk, it's trash. Seth remarked, escalating the tension. Frustrated, Ashley sought help from their father, hoping he could mediate. You can find that in the trash. Excuse me? Why don't you put it in the back and stay back there? You're just buying junk, it's trash. Unless their father seemed unbothered having dealt with their frequent fights before. Seth's continuous teasing and Les's indifference fueled Ashley's anger. It's disgusting how he talks to me like that. I don't have to talk to you. Stop it. You don't know what he just said. Oh, sir. No, you aren't. Go ahead, Jeff. Stop saying you are when you weren't, Dad. You were in the office. You did not just hear that. Looks like you picked the right person to come talk to. How he talks to me like that. Do you know how disrespected the customer felt? I don't have to talk to you. Then go! Filled with rage, Ashley confronted Seth, expressing her frustration. The heated argument escalated, reaching a point where Ashley, overwhelmed, broke down in tears. The situation became embarrassing as their emotions spilled out for employees and customers alike to witness. Had enough. Damn you no! I should never be treated like this from my own brother! And you're such an asshole to me! Stupid. Shut the up. Seth's teased. No, I'm not. I mean everything I said. Bye. Overwhelmed, Ashley decided to leave abruptly, feeling her presence was no longer needed. The episode served as a challenging example for the employees, witnessing the discord between siblings. Yeesh, the family dynamics played out in public. Bye. No, I'm not. I mean everything I said. Bye. So, so. Seth? Yeah, she's gonna be leaving here in a minute. What I don't know. Don't go. Two tornado tongued girls whirl in, demanding a new laptop like it's their birthday. Adapter? Receipt? Nah, these are just fancy words in their vocabulary. You to go back there and get the refund. I'm sorry. When we yeah. sold it to you, we gave you the adapter for it. No, you didn't. No, Less caught in the crossfire of their double-barreled chatter, throws his hands up and surrender. K 
can't want to get breathe for a second. I'm drowning in a sea of sound. But these girls are not built for silence. They repeat themselves like stuck records, each word louder than the last. They claim they bought a laptop, no adapter, and now want a free upgrade. And Les, bless his grumpy heart, tries to reason with them. Ladies, refunds don't happen without proof. Go back, get the adapter, then we talk. But these girls are allergic to logic. They throw tantrums like toddlers denied candy, their voices reaching a pitch that could shatter glass. Les, pushed to the edge, unleashes his inner grizzly bear. Hold your horses or I'll call security to hold them for ya. You remember us. I do. You don't have the adapter that I gave you. You never gave us an adapter. So go home. Why can't you help us? I don't want to get home. Everybody, oh, okay. let's, let's go. go. Please, I know let's go. Let's go. You no. give me my money. He's going. Y'all okay. okay. tripping, bro. This isn't your average customer service squabble. This is a battle for dominance, a clash of wills that can make a grown man cry. Maybe these girls need to learn some manners. When Seth dealt with a customer and his mom looking to sell a speaker, things took an unexpected turn. Despite the customer's plea and a sad story, Seth not being a good Samaritan stuck to business. How you doing? Hey, hey. how's it going? Good. Taiwan, man. Taiwan, I'm here nice today. to meet you. I got a speaker. I got you got multiple speakers. It's even better than you. Yeah. Hey, how's it going? I got a speaker, the customer explained, hoping for a decent deal. Seth, however, proposed an offer far below what the customer was expecting, causing frustration. What are you trying to give me for this? I want 150. So what you trying to give me for this? I want 150. What you selling you it or pawning it? Selling it. Yeah, Seth's counteroffer of 45 bucks didn't sit well with the customer, leading to an exchange of heated words. I don't need that. You came in. You want 150 bucks? The customer retorted, oblivious to the fact that he was in a public place. Like 45 bucks. Hell no, nah, man. Well, that's your choice. You don't have to take it. Why you can't funny. give me 100? What the situation escalated quickly as the customer's profanity-laced tirade continued. Unsurprisingly, his disrespectful language right in front of his mom earned him an unexpected consequence. <laughs> a good old fashioned ass whipping. I don't need these mother. Well, you you, you came want. in, you oh, want 150 no. bucks. Damn. What? Mama, you, you don't talk like that in front of these people. I done raised you better than that. Amazed, Seth watched as the woman disciplined her son, treating him like a kid. The unexpected turn of events left both Seth and the onlooker surprised. To Seth's astonishment, the woman even returned to apologize for her son's unruly behavior. Actions, he got himself an ass whipping. Take you nowhere. It's the whole city. Without you, the boy. Oh man, I ain't seen a whipping. Oh man. Seth, I yeah. am so sorry. No, that's fine. I apologize. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Handling my security staff. Seth's patience is hanging by a thread as this customer blows in like a hurricane, demanding her computer. No pawn ticket, no ID, just a whole lot of bad attitude. I'm here to pick up my computer. Sure. I lost my pawn ticket. Okay. You have ID? No, I gave it to the lady over there. I gave my ID. I waited. I need my computer now, she hollers. Each word of frickin' sonic boom. Seth, bless his soul, tries to navigate the storm, gently steering her to the right window. But this lady's got a temper that could melt solder. Already, I just walked over here and waited a moment. Okay. How many computer. moments did you wait? Are uh, you an idiot you. or something? I'm just trying to understand what you're I saying. Need, I need my computer. Well, she gets her computer, takes one look, and ba boom! The volcano erupts. It's scratched, stained. This wasn't like this before. Her accusations fly faster than a pawnbroker's calculator. Seth, now juggling exploding customers like a circus clown, tries to calm the waters. I would like to get my computer, please, because he can't understand. Um, I need you to sign. Here you go. Here you go to $247. But this lady's got as an insatiable an appetite for drama as the blue friend does for cookies. New computer. I want another one. Ooh, she screeches, pointing the finger like a loaded weapon. Ooh, and Seth at the end of his rope sees red. You scratched it, lady. Watch your back. Oh, no. I need to see somebody up in here. Yes, ma'am. Yes, my computer's all stretched up and stained up, and it wasn't like this when I brought it here. It says scratch. No, I did not bring this no. computer in here like this. I want me another computer for all That's an apple. What a f talk about some tension. 
thick enough to cut with a spork. Insults volley back and forth, each one sharper than a pawnbroker's wit. <laughs> Holy crap, this isn't just customer service, it's a verbal gladiatorial arena. Yo, in, you scratch it all over. Watch your back. Nah, watch yours. Let me get that door for you. There you go. Get that my ass. I think we're gonna get a two for I kick all this. <laughs> When this customer crossed the line and threatened them, Les swiftly had his security team remove the unruly man. Despite the initial confrontation, the situation took a foolish turn as the man decided to escalate things by sending death threats their way. To threaten them, Les had his security haul him out immediately. You gonna what? You heard what I said. I didn't hear what you said. Tell me what you're gonna do to me. Watch your Get your hand out of my You're gonna what? Tell me what you're gonna do to me. The man's aggressive behavior continued, leading to security promptly intervening to prevent any potential harm. The man's absurd threat to kill them raised serious concerns about the safety of everyone involved, when he decided to send death threats their way too. Kill you, motherfucker! Who you gonna kill, huh? Who you gonna kill, huh? Quick to react, the security team subdued the man before he could act on his threats. With law enforcement on the scene, the fear of facing consequences seemed to have a sobering effect on the agitated customer. It's pretty amazing how a night in the local jail can change one's perspective for the better. Ashley reported the incident, emphasizing the severity of the threat, and the officers took charge of handling the situation. The presence of law enforcement likely contributed to the man realizing the serious repercussions of his actions. I got it. Hi, I have a threat up here at American Jewelry and Lawn right now. So I was standing behind the counter, and he came up screaming. My security guard came in and started escorting him out. As he was going out is when the Despite his initial rage about losing his belongings, the man seemed to backtrack a bit, attributing his outburst to venting frustrations. While it's not an excuse for threatening behavior, it sheds light on the complex emotions that can arise in intense situations. I was mad because I lost all my stuff. I might have did say something to that effect, but it was only venting. Like any normal person A clueless dude stumbles in looking for a generator thingy that makes magic light. Seth, bless his soul, tries to explain the whole electricity generation thing in kindergarten words. But this guy, oh, denser than a block of concrete, bro. I'm looking for something like a generator like this. You want to generate electricity, yeah. right? That's what a generator does. So all you do, open up the gas can. Sure, 900 bucks for that rusty hunk of metal? The dude literally bellows. Oh, 55's my limit. Maybe six if I squint real hard. Seth, his patience thinner than a pawn shop receipt, tries to negotiate, but the dude just digs his heel in like a stubborn mule. But I don't have 900. What do you have? I only got like five. 500? Yeah. I could push it to six. I'm pretty firm in 700. Could you fire it up at my house? Once you purchase it, you can actually take it to your house. This is ridiculous, out. dude. Okay, the dude wants to borrow the generator. Borrow, like, take it home for free, play with it, and maybe, just maybe, return it someday? Seth, his face turning the color of a bad burrito, politely explains the concept of buying and owning things. But the dude bro's ears are firmly shut, locked in a world where generators sprout money and pawn shops give stuff away for free. You want to buy it or not? I want to borrow it at least. Well, borrow it? What the f will work? Give me seven hundred dollars. You can borrow it indefinitely. You want to bet? Excuse me. Have a good day, sir. Um, the hell out. Seth finally explodes. His voice cracking under the strain. The dude, as surprised as a goldfish with a harmonica, stumbles back, sputtering about ridiculousness and jaw pod service. And just like that, the Pawn Star Circus gets one more clown ejected from the ring. Ridiculous, man. Your store, bitch. I really think you offended my poll. I think I don't give a. Seth and Ashley took a bold step, meeting a potential buyer for one of their stores without informing their dad beforehand. Despite their differences, they decided to work together on this venture. However, their plan took an unexpected turn when they discovered the potential buyer was someone they knew all too well. I've been trying to find a buyer for our Pontiac location, and already the first buyer flaked out on me. But thankfully, I got another potential buyer, and Ashley agreed to meet him at the... 
Upon realizing the situation, Les, their father, expressed his disappointment and frustration, questioning their actions. Les rightfully felt betrayed and had every reason to be angry. All too well. What the f were you thinking? Did you not think that I know everything that's going on? Despite his attempt to make them understand the severity of their actions, Ashley and Seth appeared unapologetic. Doing best for the business. Don't tell me what's best for the business. Ashley attempted to shift the blame while Seth tried to justify their decision by claiming it was in the best interest of the business. Less disgusted and appalled by their behavior, decided to leave them behind and head home, expressing his loss of trust in both of them. If you keep this place, we're gonna lose money. It doesn't take a genius to understand that your empire that you built in Detroit is going to over here. Cut your losses. Trust was shattered, unless the patriarch felt deeply hurt by the unexpected actions of his kids. Trusted on both. I can't even look at you right now. A customer wanting to pawn what seems to be used hair, claiming it's like Beyonce's. The Gold siblings, however, are quick to point out the health department's rules against selling used hair due to hygiene concerns. It's a very cool piece. This look, is, this... I can brush for you too. I can brush it too, and you can call me. Bam! Hold the purse, name. I'm sorry. The health department won't let us sell used hair. Okay, so we, what's we wrong send with that? It because it's personal. The customer remains adamant, arguing that people sweat all the time. The Golds, though, maintaining a friendly tone, stand firm, emphasizing the unhygienic nature of the request. Oh, no, it's, no, it's personal hygiene. People sweat Let me ask you a question. all the time. They when got was all the last this up time? in here, funky, funky. Despite their attempts to explain, the lady insists on the deal, showcasing her persistence. The situation becomes awkward as the Golds try to navigate the delicate matter, politely declining the unusual offer. The lady's persistence clashes with the store's policies, and despite her claims of cleanliness, the hygiene factor remains a deal breaker. Don't wipe down everything. We do, but I just can't take okay, it. Okay, then you right? can wipe down the hair. Sorry, I wish I could help you, so come back. The Golds express regret but hold their ground, emphasizing that they can't proceed with such transactions. The encounter starts on a heartwarming note as a lady reveals her intention to sell her laptop to get a gift for her sister's birthday. Oh, laptop. You type in your password? What brings you in today? I just want to pawn it in so I can give my sister some money for her birthday this weekend. Oh, okay. However, things take a turn when Ashley, suspicious about the situation, asks her for the laptop's password. Well, after a bit of a struggle, the password is entered, but the friendly atmosphere quickly dissipates. Put out your password? Yeah. <laughs> Try again. As Ashley negotiates the amount for the laptop, the lady becomes increasingly demanding, insisting on a specific sum. I need at least 165. I mean, I can't, I can't do 125. Uh... All right, I can do 150, and that's what I can do. Okay, can you do 165 or not? When Ashley refuses to meet her exact request, the situation escalates with the lady expressing her displeasure loudly. The exchange becomes heated, marked by accusations of disrespect and a refusal to accept the offered amount. Despite Ashley maintaining composure, the lady decides to take her business elsewhere. I actually asked. It's so disrespectful. Well, I'm sorry. I told you I can't you know, take one. You know it's disrespectful. Respectful. Hey, learn how to talk. Me. Learn how to talk. Learn how to talk. One sixty-five. Then I can take my business somewhere else. Flat out. You done? You know, I don't give a. <laughs> like I said, I don't care. I can take my business somewhere are you else. A lady, or are you I a baby? Excuse me. In an unexpected move, she directs her frustration towards an innocent bystander, issuing threats and escalating the tension. Instead, she decided to turn her eyes towards an innocent bystander. I'm talking to you, bitch! What the f you looking at? You know what? Take Don't us outside. What the f you looking at? What the f you looking at? Fortunately, Joe, another employee, steps in to prevent a physical confrontation and escorts the lady out to avoid further disruption. I mean, bitch, you looking at me? What you want to do something? Do something! We get folks of all kinds happy, sad, mad, crazy. A customer struts in wearing a chicken costume, causing a stir. The gold siblings, maintaining their humorous side, engage with the chicken-clad visitor. 
the customer, embracing his role, claims to be all about chicken and finger sucking, adding a comical touch to the encounter. This is what I do. I say I got chicken and finger sucking. Come for a plucking. Despite the whimsical atmosphere, the Golds attempt to guide the customer towards a more serious discussion about potential purchases. The chicken, however, seems more interested in banter than business, making Seth express mild frustration, jokingly suggesting the customer might start his own joint with the chicken. The fool. I want that right there. The dude, dude, plate. Here, here's, here's what I, uh, I want you to do. Don't put the chicken on the counter. All right, look, let me see right dude, now. You're, you're spinning chicken on the counter. That's for you. When the chicken eyes a pricey watch worth $1,200, the humorous exchange takes a turn. Seth, trying to balance the humor in the business, nudges the customer to consider making a deal. The chicken, possibly more interested in the comedic aspect than the actual transaction, continues to engage in a playful banter. How much this cost? $1,200. $1,200. Are you seriously going to buy something, or are you just, uh... You ain't even let me see? I got lots of stuff for you to look at. Bro, look, hello. Dude. Dude. All right, look. As the situation unfolds, the Golds, especially Seth, playfully suggests making a deal while also subtly expressing a sense of being bothered. In the end, it turns out that this time, the chicken didn't quite make a purchase. Instead, it made a scene and eventually left the shop. Look, look, make a deal, deal. All I right, stopped off. Chicken? Touching chicken? Come on, man, let's go. And you know what? You ain't got to touch me. Turns out when the chicken crossed the road, he went to a pawn shop, made a scene, Got kicked out. There you go. So Seth's still fuming after that disrespectful encounter, and now Les wants to have a little talk with his kids. Seth's face shows that he's in for it, and Ashley trying to stir the pot, but Les is having none of it. Les is like, come on, Seth and Ashley, let's chat. Seth's pain seems to have vanished in his anger. Les is pretty upset, and he's blaming Seth and his new system for the whole mess even though it's pretty clear it was just an unreasonable customer causing a ruckus. Where the hell Seth? Seth, come on with me. You too, Ashley, come on. This guy made me so angry, I don't even feel the pain anymore. Wow. I'm sick of this Seth is trying to defend himself, but Les isn't having any of it. He's taken back control of the store, and Ashley's trying to bring up sibling rivalry stuff, but Les shuts it down real quick tough love, you know? The guy out there screaming and yelling at me because well, of that something, something that new? you did? Your system does not work, Seth. I've been watching this go down all day. This is so typical of my dad. He hasn't even given me a d Les is laying down the law, telling them people have been waiting too long and he's not interested in anyone kissing up to him. He's had enough for one day and just wants them to get back to work. No more arguing, just go back to work. Folks, classic dad move. Too long. Exactly. Stop kissing my ass. I had to deal with more than I should have today. So here's the deal. I'm in charge. Tell him I told you not to do it. I don't want to hear it. Just go back to work. It's pretty hilarious how some guys just can't handle it when the pawn shop won't drop big bucks on their trash. The pawn shop guy's like, sorry, not interested. And this dude flips out, calling for someone else like he's about to get the royal treatment. We're not interested. Let me speak to somebody else back there. Lame ass. I ain't really want much, but a few bucks, but they was on some bull. Go get somebody for me, dog. This made me act up. Yeah, what's going on, man? What's going on, cuz? I was trying to tell your man, let me get a couple dollars, you know what I'm saying? About 30, 40. You know? Yeah, I'm not interested. He's all like, I wasn't asking for much, just a few bucks, you know, like 30 or 40. But reality check, buddy, the pawn shop isn't handing out cash for stuff they can't make money on. It's not a charity. This isn't UNICEF. That we couldn't make money on. There's times that we just can't take old merchandise. This was one of those times. Hey, yo, man, carry my shit out, then. Y'all want to do like that, y'all. So he's getting all riled up, telling them to get somebody for him, and the poor pawn shop owner, Les, is just trying to keep his cool. He's surrounded by this guy acting all tough. You almost feel sorry for Les, who's doing his best not to lose it. But then this dude goes too far. Listen, mother Don't be throwing the at me. You understand? You understand? Don't be ever throwing the at me. You understand that? You understand that, man? 
after all that, Les has had enough. He's like, you want to act like that? Fine. It's like watching someone poke a bear with a stick and you just know it's all about to go down. Classic pawn shop drama, right? All right. All right. I got a better idea. How about if we don't have you come back in here? Bro, oh, it's like it's like that. I know. Hold up. Y'all ain't shit over here anyway. I smack the out your ass. Don't even reach behind nowhere. Reach away. Nigga, if I got it, got it. Reaching, Jonah. Don't I got be whatever. my stuff. I don't care how old I am. I'm never too old to beat your Threatening me that he's coming back. Does he think we don't have security cameras? Does he think we don't know what his license plate number is? It'll be his worst day if he even thinks about doing anything. Just another regular day at the pawn shop. Folks coming and going. Some with smiles, others not so much. Now here comes this guy strolling in hoping to snag a hundred bucks for his gold chain. The receptionist is all cool, approves the loan, everything seems pretty chill, right? Hold on, bro. Hold on. Let me screw my point. Now here's a guy who walks in hoping to get a loan of a hundred bucks for his gold chain. And you know what? The receptionist happily agrees. Loan approved, right? How much would you like? A hundred dollars. Okay. I can do the hundred dollar. Well, hold on to your butts because it's about to get wild. This dude, looking polite, hands over his ID for verification. <laughs> but boy, oh boy, he throws in this 20 business out of nowhere. He's pointing at the sign, claiming it's right there. He should get an extra 20%. Right. What 20%, sir? The sign right here says I get 20%. The receptionist is baffled, and the dude's politeness evaporates into thin air. Out intense. Sir, I don't know what you're talking about. Is you serious? Yes, sir. Ma'am, you ain't never seen the sign? Well, the man's voice gets louder and he's asking if she's ever seen a sign in her life. Whew. Talk about intense and rude. 20%! You serious? You gonna give me 100? Uh huh. I get 20% of 100. The guy keeps insisting that he's supposed to get that extra 20 with his 100 bucks. The whole shop's on alert now with bodyguards ready and even Seth, the boss, stepping out. Well, the tension is rising and the customer won't back down. Their pawn shop, bring me in the ticket, and when you take it out of that pawn shop, I'll give you 20. But does our furious customer listen? No way. He's demanding to see the manager, and Seth steps up to explain things patiently. Well, he keeps shouting, demanding his 20, hoping someone's gonna back him up. The bodyguard quickly takes it back, and the customer leaves, cursing and grabbing a plant to throw on the ground. Yep, it's never a dull day around here. Crazy, huh? Come on, straight up. My man, let us go. Let us go. 20 the angry customer doesn't even give Seth a chance to explain. Get something out this I'm gonna you down for this time, my man. I'm gonna you down. Get the mother Gotta admit, that's a bit hilarious. But the bodyguard quickly snatches it back, and the customer keeps cursing as he leaves the shop. But wait, there's more. To show his anger, this guy grabs a harmless plant and throws it on the ground. Huh, $20 worth right there, bitches! Aw, oh, man, what the plant do? Well, as we close this journey through the pawn shop's chaotic moments, it's evident that Les Gold and his team navigate a unique realm where deals are not just transactions, but narratives, woven with tension, humor, and a little dash of the unexpected. Whether facing threats, family disputes, or the whims of eccentric customers, the pawn shop remains a stage where characters clash, emotions flare, and the pawnbroker's wit is constantly tested.